Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Yikes! My listings aren't selling. (laughs) (laughs) Yikes, indeed. 15 reasons your listings won't sell. Julie, that's a really good title. I like it. Well, thank you. And it is a hot topic these days. I see agents posting, asking each other about it. The coaches are talking about it. This is coming out in our daily Facebook live coaching sessions. So yeah, (laughs) with more competition, it is possible your listings actually won't sell. It is actually a multifaceted problem because really, if you think about it, you have the perspective of the listing agent. You have the perspective of the buyer's agents. You have the perspective of the seller's neighbors. But most importantly, you have the perspective of the seller as to why the listing hasn't sold. Yes. And so if you're an inexperienced listing agent, no disrespect if you haven't sold during a changing market, let alone a buyer's market, and your listing starts sitting on the market longer, uh, you know that's going to cause you a lot of stress. But there are systems. There are things you can do. There are a lot of ways that you can go about setting the table in such a way that you won't lose the listing, the seller won't fire you, you won't feel un- un- unnecessarily stressed out about, you know, essentially this transitioning market. The reality of it is, is that in a normal market, most listings stay on the market for 90 to 120 days. But if you're, you know, you have never dealt with that yourself as a listing agent, as a real estate agent, but guess who else hasn't dealt with it? Your sellers. Mm, (laughs) Most of your sellers do not have realistic expectations of how long homes should take to sell. So they're the ones that are flipping out. They're the ones that are freaking out. They're the ones after about 22 seconds who are going to start questioning whether or not they hired the right listing agent. This is the reason you need to pay very close attention to this two-part series that Julie and I are presenting to you on the podcast and uh, really take note of all this because this all has to do with your level of professionalism and setting realistic expectations for the seller and frankly giving a lot of practical tactical things to get the listing sold faster even though the average days in the market listeners um, in a normal market is say 90 days to 120 days it doesn't mean that your average days in the market has to be that long your average days in the market can still be a matter of weeks or even days or, you know, you guys get the point. You don't have to be average. You can be swinging a heck of a lot better than average. And that's what we're going to help you to do as part of our coaching program, which by the way, you can join Premier Coaching right now, 100% for free. Just text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372. That's Premier, P-R-E-M-I-E-R to 47372. And when you do, you're going to have instant access to a daily semi-private coaching call with one of our Harris certified coaches, an absolute ton of content. Julie and I actually were just going through that uh, right prior to this podcast today, looking at all the stuff that you guys get as part of level one. It's very comprehensive. I was actually worried that it might be a little bit too much information, but we're not going to take anything away. It's all there. Real estate treasure map, your scripts, objection handlers, how to work with, uh, you know, obviously the seller plan, how to work with social media, all these, all this content, everything that you guys are looking for that you think you need and that you absolutely do need is waiting for you in Premier Coaching. And did I mention it's free? So just text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372. Or if you're outside of the continental United States or just frankly would prefer just to go to the website directly, you can just go to members.timandjulieharris.com. Members.timandjulieharris.com. We know you love what you get on our YouTube channel and our podcast. Imagine what it's going to be like when you would become a Premier Coaching member. So do not wait. Text the word Premier to 47372. Um, Remember when texting message and data rates may apply. That's right. So again, today we're talking about 15 reasons your listings won't sell. We're not going to get through all 15 today. This is a two-part series. But now that there are more listings, buyers have more choices. And with more choices, buyers' agents look for reasons not to show a property. And buyers look for reasons not to buy it or to simply keep looking. And remember, it's not just the uh, more inventory that's for sale that's also going to cause the buyers to be uh, a little gun shy. It's also the fear of the economy, the fear of their job, fear, 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 right? We can just compound all the fears, inflation, elections, interest rates, all the rest of it, Uh, lender overlays, all the things we talk about in our coaching program. So you've got to understand that it's not just an excessive amount of inventory that's going to cause days in the market to extend. It's also, uh, frankly, buyers being uncertain. 
That's right, and that means that buyers who are still serious are that much more valuable, aren't they? That's right. So there will be fewer of them, but they will be more serious, and you want to make sure that those buyers are the ones that buy your listings. So according to a Forbes report today, active listing inventory in the U.S. is up nearly 31% for a third month in a row. Along with this comes longer days on the market, fewer competitive offers, and more power to those qualified buyers. So what causes a listing not to sell? Why does it expire? Why does it get deprioritized by buyers or buyer's agents? Don't make these mistakes. So we're going to start with part one, point number one. The listing is poorly presented. Now, that didn't matter in the previous market, did it? It just had to be available. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> okay. But it is possible that this will cause your listing not to get shown, not to get sold, to sit on the market and ultimately to expire on you. So the listing might be poorly presented, not being staged correctly. This includes lots of different things, but the short list is clutter, questionable smells, not being clean, and not being bright. The goal is for the listing to show like new, like a new construction model home. Consider adding shoe covers in a basket by the foyer. We used to do this with a sign that says, please remove your shoes or cover them to protect the floors, which may someday be yours. Makes a great first impression. Now, so this whole clutter thing and this whole essentially condition issue, remember when a uh, it comes down to price, condition, location. So if a house isn't selling, generally speaking, it's one or two, obviously, of the three things. If it's all three things, you got a real problem. So what you'll discover is, let's say you have it priced right, and let's say there's not a location issue and the house is still sitting on the market, it's most definitely a condition issue. This is in any market. Even if it is an extreme buyer's market, things will still sell if priced correctly, if priced, uh, you know, essentially taking the location into consideration, good or bad, and condition being obviously the next big thing. But what you'll be surprised to know is one of the biggest determinants as to whether most buyers will buy a house or not is Julie's first point. The actual way it's presented because people buy emotionally. You know, there's, you guys know this, you, you feel this way, you think this way yourselves, but if the house just looks, you know, frankly cute, if it's got flowers, if it's got, mm -hmm. if it's taken after, if it looks nice, if it doesn't look neglected, if it looks when you walk into the house that if somebody loves the house, you're going to love the house too. But it get, and we have all this in Premier Coaching, but it also, it also drills down to remove family pictures, do things like that. You, go ahead. You Future say, points, yes. Yeah, we're oh, going to drill down sorry. on this. But, yeah. but this is a, a general thought that the listing is just being poorly presented. Now, listing agents, you are going to have to make more of an effort on this, and we'll get into some drill down on that. If but, you're, if yeah. you're, you might not be objective about the condition of the house because you're so excited to get the listing, yeah. um, and I still feel that way, frankly. I don't, mm -hmm. Julie and I don't list real estate, but I remember feeling that way. You didn't, for some reason, smell the cat pee odor because you were so excited about <laughs> right. getting a new listing. You know That's natural and normal. So sometimes it actually, actually benefits benefits you to have somebody come in that's objective and give the seller a list of things that need to be done. And there are lots of places in the mm -hmm. uh, people in the marketplace that specialize in staging properties. Well, that's right. And you don't ha or the seller doesn't have to pay a huge amount of money to that stager. There's a lot of stagers that will just give an hour or two of their time to give advice. You guys should all be friends with stagers anyway, because they're also a great source of listing leads. Now I'm going to give you another little advanced coaching tip. If you think you're a stager um, and you want to be a listing agent, if you go into the listing appointment telling the seller what to do to position the house, don't be surprised if you don't get the listing because you actually offended them telling them what was wrong with their property. You went and explained to them how some uh, you know couch doesn't look good here or how some you know this, that, or the other isn't appropriate or you know, you're trying to be an expert outside of the the rails of what they expect you to do. And that's going to cause you not to get the listing. So that's oftentimes one of the best reasons to use a stager because you can go through the house. You can make an objective list of what you see is wrong with the house. You can write it down. Don't let the seller see. <laughs> and then pass that along to this third party stager and have the third party stager uh, be the bad guy when telling the seller that indeed they can't keep small uh, donkeys in the kitchen. <laughs> well, that's right. It is a delicate balance, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you want to advise them to stage it properly without losing the listing over it. Right. And that's the kind of detailed things that you get in coaching that we can't do on a podcast. The key thing to remember, one of the key things, again, advanced coaching here, is no matter, you always love the seller's house. You always love the listing. You always are enthusiastic about the listing. You cannot, no matter what, not be enthusiastic about the listing or you won't get the listing. An agent who overprices and you know, even charges 27,000% commission, 
and is enthusiastic about the house will get the listing over you yep. who's I'm just being honest with you about the condition. I'm just being honest with you about the price. You, you cannot be like that. You need to make the seller believe that you believe in the product. And if you're a low emotions type person, get over it because ultimately sellers are going to always be attracted to people that have a higher level of energy and enthusiasm for their listing. In their minds, they're thinking, if you don't sell me on why you love my house, how the hell are you going to sell a buyer into why they should love the house? You guys get it? Point number two. That's right. Point number two. The listing has a non-compelling description. You guys have all seen this in the MLS. Yep. This includes plain vanilla words like open and airy floor plan. Well, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, it does. It means it needs windows. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, no windows, right? Don't make it sound like every other listing. Make the description convince me to show this property first. If I'm a buyer and I'm looking online, I need to be dying to see your listing. Not like, eh, you know, let's keep looking. Well, here's the hack for this, and it's not that difficult. Go to realtor.com and start clicking around in different cities and markets and start looking for really great housing descriptions and then cut and paste them and put them in a file. Don't just steal the, the copy because it's copywritten, but you can at least get some ideas on how to write property descriptions. Well, you know what we used to do is we used to get the British Homes magazines yep. and uh, what is you know all the high-end, the luxury magazines, but especially the British ones have better language. It just sounds better <laughs> to survey your grounds versus nice backyard. Well, I'll tell you guys something funny. <laughs> so we live in Puerto Rico. And uh, <laughs> I, mean, from today. I, I know from just today. And so there's this new seven home subdivision. It's not even a subdivision. It's a street that's getting built in uh, behind our there's a so we live in Puerto Rico. There's a golf course that's getting rehabbed. And then there's this new street where there's seven homes that are getting built in. But I'm going to tell you guys this. You'll be shocked. But this is true. These houses start at 15 million dollars each. OK, now there's a lagoon that has been there probably since day one when the earth was formed, that's basically <laughs> back there that's going to be backing up to where these houses are. And Julie and I, having lived in Puerto Rico in our home for about three, three and a half years, I can tell you that lagoon is, um, well, let's just put it this way. They found an alligator crawling out of it about a year ago. Yeah, you don't want to fall into that lagoon. And there's not supposed to be alligators in uh, Puerto Rico. They're not indigenous to Puerto Rico. But there are also big, huge uh, snapping turtles that are in there. Nobody lets their kids or their dogs swim in, uh, swim in this lagoon. Fish. <laughs> huge fish. Huge fish. I think they have teeth. So what I'm saying is this is this is something that's been this lagoon or you know pond, whatever the hell you want to call it. It's like a big lake has been there since the formation of the earth. It is prehistoric. And there's things that are living in there that people just sort of like, they don't, you walk past it, you don't want to look in the water kind of thing because yeah. something might be looking back at you. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to make you for guys sure. laugh, but you're getting the point here. So we're reading a description for the <laughs> for the the lake, you know, the lagoon that backs up to these $15 million properties. And you, sh you guys should have read it. It was so funny. It was talking about the mystical, historic, and they even had some fancy name for the lagoon. What was it, was it called? Awesome. I don't know, enchanting or yeah, something. Yeah, and, and Julie and I just couldn't stop laughing. But you know what? That's really good sales copy Seriously. if you're trying to sell a house that happens to back next to a prehistoric swamp. Yeah, go listing agent. <laughs> nice job. That's what we're talking about, you know, because I'd want to show that, right? Yeah. Okay, so along those lines, point number three, it's possible that the listing has terrible pictures. Again, some of this, most of it, you could get away with in the previous market, but not so anymore when you have competition. Now, terrible pictures can include, but not be limited to, tiny iPhone pictures, pictures with kids sleeping in their beds for the bedroom pictures, <laughs> kitchen pictures with dirty dishes. I once saw one, it was like uh, the, the agent had taken a picture, there were drapes in the great room, and there were like feet sticking out underneath the drapes like somebody was hiding. It's crazy. In fact, there's whole websites devoted to terrible know, listing pictures. Uh, but it can also be... You know, the agent's reflection taking the picture in the bathroom mirror, that looks dumb. Any number of unprofessional pictures. It used to be no pictures at all, but now MLSs require pictures. So now they're just crappy pictures. Depending on, obviously, your cash flow, really the bottom line, and probably the sale price of the house, you really do want to have somebody go in there and take pictures and make brochures for you. Once you start listing more houses as a premier coaching member, that's going to be one of the things we're going to ask you to consider delegating somebody to deliver a sign, somebody to take pictures and, and then put the home brochure together so you don't have to do it. All these little tiny um, uh, details matter, but if you're just getting started, do all this yourself. And to Julie's point, lots of great information out there. Just again, go to listings that you really admire. Look to see where they took the pictures. Okay, so you're now looking at a kitchen picture of some house. 
you know, it doesn't matter where, and look to see how they staged the picture and just sort of copy the overall themes. It's not that difficult, guys. Nope. This isn't rocket science. It isn't. Now, number four is another hangover from the previous hot seller's market. The listing might have too many showing restrictions. Now, you guys used to do this because you wanted to make it active on Thursday, show it on Friday, gather offers on Saturday, and decide on Sunday. Well, let's also be honest. They were also wanting to sell it to their own buyer. Of course. So they were trying to put a whole bunch of obstacles in the way of co-op showings. Mm -hmm. Reality, right? That's right. But now it can cause your listing not to sell. Now, if you can only show it on a Friday afternoon if the baby isn't sleeping and it's sunny outside, you're not going to get that many showings. And if you can't show it, you can't sell it. So back off on the showing restrictions. Like have none, really. That's the key. Um, again, sellers are spoiled. If they've sold during the hot seller's market, they're used to pushing the market around. And you will find sometimes you'll go off and t you'll talk to the seller. And the seller is motivated. This house is in a great location, a great condition. But the seller is just an absolute off the rocker about restricting people having access to the property. You can't be doing silly things like, you know, overly or limiting the amount of time that people have access to the property. Or no lockbox. Or not calling the co-ops back or not showing, uh, letting the buyer agents uh, have access. But there's a lot of other little things. Like some, I see this still happening in some of our upper end uh, coaching clients markets. They will put in, and we tell them to remove it, that all buyers must submit some sort of financial proof or whatever. Don't do stuff like that in this market. Or they have to talk to your lender. Exactly. Well, look, there's nothing wrong with that inherently, but the reality of it is, is if you're in a very competitive market and your listing is not getting showings and the other listings are selling, you're doing something wrong and you're allowing the seller to make bad decisions about access to the property. Well, look, if you were the only listing available in five subdivisions, you could get away with some of that. You could be a bit more strict. But if there's five homes now competing with you and the buyer can only see three this afternoon, you're going to lose if you do that. As a rule, guys, do not make it difficult to sell to, for people to, to buy what you have for sale. Yeah. The harder you make it for people to buy what you have for sale, the fewer sales you will have. Exactly. So point number five, the listing might have poor curb appeal or no curb appeal. 50% of the buying decision is made from the street. Does your listing look like a house that someone would be proud to come home to? Do simple things to improve the curb appeal, like a wreath on the door, a nice front doormat, plants on the porch, landscaping, weed removal, undead the grass, etc. Well, there was, um, I think, Jules, there was different reports, and we have this in our complete home selling guide, right, uh -huh. that they get as far as premier coaching. Yep. We have a guide that you give to the seller when you take the listing, and it tells them what the return on investment will be for doing certain types of repairs. And like anything that has to do with the elevation or the front, you know, how the house looks from the street, you make money on it. So if you spend like a thousand dollars on the landscaping, you get like five thousand dollars back. You know, it's crazy. They've studied this. It, it actually says something like an additional fifteen hundred dollars in price per mature tree in the front lawn. Exactly. And so, yes, you want to make the house look really good. People will make the more houses you sell, the more buyers you work with. I am always trying to tune our messaging into experienced agents and new agents. So experienced agents, you know what I'm about to say is true. You will have a buyer who is standing at, you know, on the side while lo looking at the house and they'll have made their decision where they're going to buy the house or not. 90% uh, based on how it looks from the, uh, from the street. So if it's got a good location, it's in the neighborhood that they want. It's in the price range that they can afford. And it looks cute from the street. 90% of the time, yeah, that's a done. sold house. They could open up the house and going to be a pigsty. They will see past it. And I'm not saying let your sellers have pigsties as houses. What I'm saying is the thing that matters most is the appearance from the street. People do judge a book by its cover and don't try to fight with that. It is what it is. Yes. And if it does present poorly, assuming they even made it in the front door, what kind of offer are they going to write if it's full of weeds in the front yard? They're going to assume the seller has broken up with the house. They're ready to take whatever price. They just want to be out of there. So it can also affect any contract that you get. When she means broken up, what she means is they've lost interest in the house yeah. and they're just ready to, ready to fire sell it. You know, that's, that's these, the assumption. Anyway. It is, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, related to this, when you are in the front door, point number six, the listing gives a bad impression when you open the front door. That could cause them to turn right around or to not make an offer. So uh, the other 50% uh, other than curb appeal is made in the foyer. A clutter-free, bright foyer should make the buyer want to see the rest of the house, not make them want to turn around and go see the next home. In most cases, the problems that you're going to be experiencing with houses with regards to staging, it comes down to uh, just a few things. Too much furniture, too much junk. Clutter. And, uh, clutter. Like anything on the walls, family pictures. 
And also the house is too dark. So when you hire a stager, what they're going to tell you to do is remove all the sort of tchotchke things and plates on the wall. I mean, gosh, I, <laughs> all the things we've all, seen, all the things that people put on the walls. You know, if you're in Texas, there's going to be dead animal heads on the walls. Awesome. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> oh, welcome gosh. home. Yeah, I know. You know, well, all, scuffs on the walls. There's a, a great magic thing called Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to get all those scuffs off of white woodwork. Exactly. Be a fanatic in a market like this, positioning the house. I, I will tell you guys a real funny story. This is, I'll never forget this because it was when we, Julie and I first started selling real estate. I, <laughs> I tell this story. Which one are you thinking of? <laughs> uh, uh, I actually just remembered her name, but I'm not going to say it out okay. loud. So we would, um, I, you know, I would open the door to the house and this is like our first or second year in real estate. And the first thing that she would do, and you actually, I think worked with her too, mm -hmm. is she would go right to the refrigerator and look in the flipping refrigerator. And I thought, and I didn't say anything, right? I'm a new oh, agent. this was a buyer, right? A buyer, yeah. yeah. And I didn't think anything of it. I thought, well, okay, this lady must be hungry. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. She didn't tell me what the hell she was doing. She was married. So she would walk in the door. I'd open the door. She'd walk in the door. She'd go right to the refrigerator and look in the refrigerator. And so after this happened three or four times, and I think actually it was on her second trip, all these memories are coming back to me. Mm -hmm. I asked her, you know, as she became more comfortable with me and me with her, I asked her, you know, do you want me to bring a snack along? <laughs> you know, are you hungry? What's going on? And this is what she told me. And I thought it was really actually very interesting and a great education for me. She said, Tim, this is our first house. And my grandmother told me, it may have been her mom, that the first thing you do when looking at a property is look how they keep their refrigerator because if they don't keep their refrigerator clean, you can pretty much, and that's where they keep their food, you can pretty much be guaranteed that there's other things that are hiding in the house, the things that are being neglected. It yep. might look good, it might smell good, but if the refrigerator is not clean with rotten this and rotten the other thing, and that's where they keep their food, then that's not a house for me. And she actually lived by that. And I always... It's interesting, the, right? The, the house that she bought had, of course, an immaculate refrigerator. I know, but you know, that, that's very insightful how people make their decisions and run things through a filter. And these are all easy things that you can win at, right? None of this costs any money to fix. All right, so point number seven is kind of unusual, and it's something that I discovered when we were carrying a bunch of listings, and sometimes something wouldn't get shown. It could be that something is actually wrong with your actual MLS listing. Get back in and take a look at it. Maybe your pictures aren't loading, the description doesn't make sense, or it's not categorized correctly. If you don't put in the square footage at all and someone's searching by 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, your listing might not be popping up at all. There can be many various different little glitches in an MLS listing. So get in there and take a look at it yourself and search on a different computer other than yours. Search on your iPhone. How does, how does it appear? Do a Google search for the address. How is it popping up? Is there something that's just set up wrong? Maybe you thought it loaded and it didn't. We've had instances where uh, coaching clients have thought it was active, but it wasn't actually showing active. And remember, there's two places you can put in comments. It's the consumer face and com uh, comments. That's where you're basically trying to make the swamp sound like a mystical lagoon, right? right. And, and then there's the agent comments. And the agent comments, most agents won't put any comments in the agent comments. And the agent's comments is where you're supposed to be letting that agent know the house is very showable, easily showable. Seller's very cooperative. Seller's very, you know, motivated. Yes, the pool table's included at full asking price. You need to sell the listing to the listing or the buyer's agent in the comments and then sell the house to the consumer in the consumer facing comments. Yes, Don't be lazy. If there is something wrong that you're taking care of, maybe the pool is currently green and the pool guy can't get there. You can put that in those comments saying pool is going to be cleaned, rehabbed, fixed, whatever. Maybe the roof is being worked on. That's where you put those comments to help sell it. And to that point, on the kitchen counter or whatever is most convenient, make sure if there's any work that's being done to the property or any work that was just done to the property, including maybe a pre-inspection, leave that there for the buyer to see. Actually leave it there. Like, for example, if um, the feedback has been after a few showings that the master bath uh, needs to be remodeled. It's some crazy dark color or something. It's Mauve. just people don't like it right. <laughs> then you need to go and get some estimates of what it would cost to remodel the bathroom with some renders, what it would look like. So the buyer can actually see what it would cost and all the rest of it, right? You need to be proactive. Don't just sit around and wait for the house to sell itself is really the big takeaway from part one. You need to be actively participating in the sale of the property 
And in doing so, by the way, what you'll discover, especially if you do open houses and whatnot, is you'll start selling more of your own listings. And who's better to co-op with than yourself, right? Well, that's absolutely right. Now, any one of these first, I think we did seven things today, any one of these seven can cause a home not to sell. And if you've got more than one going on at the same time, you've got to either correct that with price or correct that, you know, correct course to get it sold. But it is interesting. In the first seven points, we didn't talk about price. Now, we will be talking about price in point number eight. But the first things we that most buyers, uh, you would think that most buyers are going to be sorting by price, location, and condition. And they do initially. That's the analytical brain at work. But ultimately, the, what they decide to buy is 100% emotions. I do not care if it's the most spreadsheeted, analytical, engineer type uh, that you've ever met in your life, and they never smile, they barely make eye contact, you know, like Julie was when I first met her. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> you know, you guys get the point? And so when you're in a situation like that, that person's even buying uh, emotionally. They're thinking where to put their gaming set, or they're thinking how big's the garage so I can do my woodworking hobby or whatever. So even the most analytical human, when it comes to buying the place they're going to live in, buys emotionally. So don't get suckered into believing that, you know, the age of the furnace and all these little analytical details, what's the exact serial number on the water cooler or the water heater so we can determine how many months left it's got. That's not the reason that someone's going to buy the property. They're going to buy it emotionally. When, they st when you start going down the rabbit hole of being the, you know, the home decorator, when you start going to the rabbit hole of trying to be the home inspector and all the rest of this, you will not be selling real estate. It has to, I mean, it literally has to feel right to that potential buyer yep. prospect. And that's kind of hard to define. That sounds really nebulous, right? But you know, when you walk through a listing, and this is another reason to do open houses, when you go through a listing, how does it make you feel? Does it feel cozy to you? Does it feel positive to you? Or does it kind of gross you out? Kind of, yeah, like, I don't know what that smell is. Get me out of here. And many different flavors in between. But what you're striving for to point number one, make it feel like a new construction model home. There's a reason why builders sell that because it smells good, it looks good, it's decorated nice, it doesn't have a bunch of clutter, it doesn't have family pictures on the wall, it doesn't have un un you know, unidentifiable smells. And if you haven't been through new construction models, that's something to do this weekend so that you can get a feel for what looks really good, bright colors, all of that good stuff. Let me leave you with this one little bit of uh, coaching advice. If they don't like it, you like it. If they like it, you love it. I'm gonna say that again. Never have a bad opinion about any house ever. Do not ever say anything bad about anything, especially when you're trying to be a listing agent. Keep your mouth shut. Yes, it's not your house, right? I don't care if you hate split levels. You don't talk like that. But it, it, it's, it's what Julie just said. But also, we're thinking on the buyer side. If you walk into a split level that you happen not to like, they might love split levels because that's the house they grew up in. And not only yeah. did you just blow the sale, but they're probably going to fire you because you don't like what they like. You guys get it? Keep your mouth shut. That is really what hopefully the big takeaway will be from today's show. If they don't like it, you like it. And if they like it, you love it. Don't forget that. On the listing side of things, that's especially true. You do not say bad things about somebody's property. You do not mention the fact that the you know it stinks and the wallpaper is ugly and all the rest of it. That is not your job. Your job is to get the house listed and then you follow the steps that we are going to show you more about on uh, part two and obviously in the coaching program and then to get it sold. Do remember what we're telling you here. They will not list with you unless they like you. They will not like you unless you love what they have to sell and it's that it's their house. Remember that. It's important. This is something that many of you, if you get it now, hopefully some of you are new and you're understanding what I'm saying and the importance of it, you will have an unfair advantage in the marketplace because the big mistake that most agents make is they think they're supposed to have opinions on everything. Exactly. Nowadays, people feel obligated to have opinions on everything. That is not your job. Your license says real estate sales agent. It says specifically what your responsibilities are. Stick within the rails and you'll be much happier. You'll have much happier clients and you'll make much more money. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.